welcome to our virtual first Friday event, um, Winter in the Whites. A lot of you know who I am. I'm Pam Sullivan, the executive director at REN. I have here at our team, I have uh, Thomas Lane. He is um, our engineer and he's behind, we're actually, we do this so professionally, I'll tell you now. When we first started the last one, it was like we're running around the room with stuff. We're trying to do it much more professionally. So anyways, um, and we have Maisie White, who is our gallery coordinator with us this evening. Um, I'm so sorry that we can't gather in person. I mean, our goal is that by this summer, we're going to do it. We're going to, hopefully we can, we can work it so that we can have um, the outside uh, patio be integrated so that we can start getting together six feet apart and maybe we'll have lines, but we're going to figure it out. So anyways, that's what's going on. So I also want to thank um, our 2021 gallery season sponsor, the uh, Adair Inn here in Bethlehem which is so exciting. So uh, check out the Adair Inn. Uh, you can dine there, you can stay there, you can use their grounds to cross country and snowshoe. Um, wonderful people and we're so happy to have them on board. The other thing that all of the artists work that are here on exhibit at Wren, at simultaneously there'll be shows down at the Adair Inn. So each of our artists have at least one piece down at the Adair Inn. So you can see them there as well. So that's kind of neat. Um, so anyways, um, uh, a little bit about our artists. Um, uh, Chris uh, Whitton, right? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Whitton, Whitton, not Whitton, Whitton. Whitton, Whitton. Okay, Chris, I'm gonna get it right. Sorry, we're gonna have to hold up flashcards for me. So sorry. Is a photographer. He resides here in Bethlehem. Um, Chris captures the raw beauty and the dramatic contrast of the Northern New Hampshire landscape through his talented visions. Chris, you can, you, if you follow him on Facebook, um, if you don't, you need to. Last week we had the most amazing Alpen Glow. Chris was here in Wren, like getting ready for the show. And the next thing I know, three hours later, I'm seeing these fantastic images flash across Facebook. He also is known um, of uh, giving some of his uh, secret trails out to people too, that how to get there and stuff. Um, so thank you, Chris, so much for participating. We have Daryl Hawk, who's a photographer. Daryl's new to Wren. Welcome, Daryl. Um, he recently moved to Lancaster, New Hampshire. Uh, Daryl has traveled uh, alone to some of the most remote, isolated places in the world. He likes to tell stories through his images and his camera. And again, welcome, Daryl. Uh, we have Michelle Johnson, who is um, no stranger to Wren. She's a painter. She lives in Colebrook, New Hampshire. She's always struck by the peace and serene qualities of what surrounds her as she makes her way through the woods and snows on a cross-country skis. Her work is just amazing. Um, you know, you look at it, you see the roots, you see the ground and you see these trees and the sky. She just connects and anchors herself with her paintings to the earth. Rebecca M. Fullerton, and I'm gonna call her that. She's gonna go by Becky the rest of the night, but Rebecca M. Fullerton is a painter. She resides here in Bethlehem. She's been involved in Wren for a few years and um, she has a passion for the forests and mountains of New England. When she's not painting, She's most likely hiking, running a trail, or on a river in her kayak. And we're so grateful to have Rebecca part of our event this evening. So what we're gonna do now is um, uh, we, we learned from our last experience that it's best to actually pre-record a video of the exhibition. And that's what we're gonna do of Maisie taking a tour around the actual gallery. So we're gonna have Tom bring that up and you guys can take a look at that and then we're going to continue with with some more of our programming so and sit back and enjoy hi there my name is Maisie Cash and I'm here at Wren at the Winter in the Whites show that runs from February 5th to March 28th okay so first up we have Chris Witten he's a popular local photographer and he got all of his frames done handmade here locally as well, which is really cool. So this first one is called Winter on the Ammo Trail, and he perfectly captured what it's like to be hiking up to the top, up to the summit of something up here in the winter, 
just coming out of the tree line and he's got this green glow from the sky coming back behind and it's really beautiful. Mount Pierce Alpen Glow. These are all 11 by 17, these frames. And yeah, you can see this Alpen Glow, the, the classic pink that comes over Mount Washington when you're looking from Mount Pierce. Down below we have First Snow from Cherry Pond. Cherry Pond is out in Whitefield, so very local to us. And you can see this beautiful reflection from the mountains into the pond with this dusting of snow and ice over the pond as well. Misty Winter Morning Sunrise. I believe this river that he captured is out in Gorham, New Hampshire. And um, you can see the ridge line of the presidentials perfectly with this pink glow behind the trees and it's reflecting down into the river. And this is a 20 by, 40, 20 by 40 floating metal frame. Um, next up is Winter Stone Wall, Sugar Hill View. It's an 11 by 17. And um, stone walls in Sugar Hill are super popular. So it's cool to have this captured with Cannon and Lafayette behind it and all dusted and caked in snow. Down below is the last light from Sugar Hill. It's a similar view as the one above, but with this, again, alpine glow of pink coming over Cannon and Lafayette as well. Um, and you can see a little house in the foreground and it just looks so peaceful with all this snow dusting. And lastly, from Chris Witten, we have Heavenly Winter Glow. And it truly is heavenly with these feathery clouds bursting up from these layers of mountains in the distance. And you can see these like, caked trees that is so classic for the tops of the mountains up here in the whites and yeah it's really magical so next up is daryl hawk and he has all 11 by 14 matted and black framed photos um, and this first one is called brisson sunset and you can see the orange glow behind the or in the glistening of the trees of the foreground as well as in the background you've got this like strip of yellow orange sunset, it's really beautiful. And next is Garland Brook from Daryl Hawk again. And yeah, just you know when the ice like crystallizes over a flowing stream and so some of the water is going and some isn't, he captured it really wonderfully. Appalachia Waterfall, um, so down south, he got the motion of the water coming through over the crystallized ice and um, and a little green pool here behind. Next up is Wild One, and it's of a horse with its chin over the um, barbed wire fence and looking curiously at the camera. And he just has such a sweet little face on, or look on his face, as well as you can see the wind blowing and his hair blowing behind him. And um, yeah, I think any horse lover would really love it. Next is Foliage and Snow, again by Daryl Hawk. And it looks like it's done, or was taken on the shoulder season of fall to winter. And it's got a blanket of snow on the ground with just the remaining yellows and oranges of the trees with some mist and fog in the distance, which is really beautiful. Next is Michelle Johnson's work. She works with acrylic on canvas. And this, fourth, and this first one is an 11 by 14 called The Shape of Things. And you can see light coming in from behind the trees. And she loves to capture what things would be like underneath the soil. So you can see these like speckled colors um, below the trees and just really magically captured. Next is Where the Magic Happens, also by Michelle Johnson. And it's like in the spring when it starts to spit snow. And so you still have the green of the ground with like, you know, these magical, um, uh, snowflakes that glisten, you know, behind the trees, and it's just, she captured it perfectly, I think. Nature versus Nurture, and this one is a 30 inch by 40 inch um, acrylic on canvas again, and it's like looking up at the branches of a tree from down below, and I would love to interpret that this is snow glistening from below or from above and she has all of these little patterns in each flake and gosh it's just so mystical and wonderful. This next one is called Into the Woods in Winter 
and um, it's also acrylic on canvas, and it's a 12 by 16. And again, she's got this light coming in from behind, and you can see underneath the soil, she's got yellows and pinks and reds, and all of the blue glow, which happens in winter for sure, and I love that she enhanced that blue. This one is called Wintering. It's an 18 by 24. And every once in a while, Michelle Johnson gets these outlines, and she does these outlines on her trees and mountains, and here she did hot pink, or it's like a soft hot pink. And it's just so magical. And down below, again, she captured what's going on below the ground, and more pink and yellows and greens and purples. And yeah, it's a really fun piece. All right, Silent Sentinel 2 and Silent Sentinel 1. They come done as a pair, although they could be sold separately. And they are each 7 by 14s on canvas. And again, she's got the light coming in from the back. Here you can see even that like burst of a glow from the sun. And in the, in the snow, where she has this soft blue, she also has the underground pinks and purples and greens. Next up, we have Rebecca Fullerton, who has a wide range of abilities. And this first one is her watercolor work and pen. And it's called Ready for Winter. It's watercolor and ink on paper. And it's a nine inch by nine inch of a wood stove. So just that super sentimental feeling of winter. Next is Mid Anchor Winter from Rebecca Fullerton. Um, these are all oil on panel. And I believe her husband makes the frames as well. So those are done in her own home as well. And yeah, she's got this like blue mountain down up in the back and just soft snow in the foreground. And she just has such a light touch with the trees. And I think they're really beautiful. Down below is along the Northern Slopes. Um, it's an oil panel. These are both eight by eights. And it's like you're standing on a hiking trail looking out on, um, on what you see, you know? It's like you're right there, and I think that's really wonderful. This next one is Franconia Ridge from Artist Bluff. It's an oil on panel and 12 by 12. And yeah, most people who live up here have hiked Artist Bluff before, and so you can see this like very familiar view of the Franconia Ridge, and that would be Lafayette up there through the trees. Next up is Crawford Brook in Winter. And this is a 30 inch by 45 inch, epically done by Rebecca Fullerton. And in the background, you can see this like pink glow as if it's done in morning. It just totally blows my mind. And all, every single branch has all of this detail of the snow in blues and the water is perfectly blue. You can see the rocks underneath the water. And this is just epically done, epically, epically done. So Rebecca Fullerton is an avid hiker, and as an avid hiker myself, I can say that this is exactly what winter trails look like um, hiking in the winter. And you have this yellow blaze, which we follow along these trails. And um, yeah, so she's got this blue trail going through that just you know ends in the distance. And I think it's so, like every single tree has all of this snow detail really wonderfully done. It's called the Yellow Blaze, a 16 by 20. Thanks again for joining me for the Winter in the White show that's debuting between February 5th and March 28th. Um, if you want to learn more about the artists, you can go to redworks.org and, um, and also you can check out more in-depth views of each piece on the lookbook. And, um, and you can also purchase them on the website as well. So I hope you enjoy your winter in the whites through our website. And again, my name is Maisie. Enjoy your evening. All right. That was entertaining for me. <laughs> now that we've um, talked with the artists a bit before the show, there's so much more to learn. And so when we get to the artist round table, um, there's a lot more in-depth information about each piece. And now we're going to look at the lookbook. Tom's going to pull it up for us. And you can find this lookbook, like I said in the video, on renworks.org. And it just has a lot more in-depth information about each piece and about each artist. And you can also purchase um, the pieces from the lookbook as well. 
So here we are. Um, we introduce Rebecca Fullerton first, and you can see down in the bottom left corners, you can see like materials, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that the artists use and then the prices. And there's even a link there that says purchase this piece where you can do that. And we had a photographer here who took uh, pictures of each one professionally so that you get a lot of the detail and true color in the lookbook as well. Yeah, so at renworks.org, this is up on the site there. And this will be up for as long as the show is up. So from now until the 28th of March. Yeah, so up next, we're going to have the round table, the artist round table. So we have all of the artists here, which is really wonderful. We have two photographers and the two painters. Um, so first up, we're going to talk to Chris Witten or Whiten about <laughs> um, about his photography. So he's a popular local photographer here, and he was the first one that I walked you through in the gallery. It's right behind me, actually. So um, Becky, would you ask Chris about his photography? I'd be happy to. Yes. So Chris, you are fantastic photographer here in the White Mountains, which of course are known for their rather uncooperative weather to begin with, but being a photographer here in winter, I can only imagine has many, many, many added challenges. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the logistics and the planning and the misadventures that I'm sure go into venturing out into some of our higher summits in the winter because some of your work obviously you're you're going to places up high above tree line and um, being out there exposed in the weather for long periods of time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks Rebecca um, yeah it's 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 definitely been a, a long journey I've been hiking since I was eight nine years old um, so I've had a lot of opportunity to make mistakes and, and learn from them, uh, fortunately surviving them. So uh, living up here all my life, um, I started mostly just summer hiking and fall, spring, winter was something I didn't really get into until recently. Um, well, recently within the last decade or so. Um, and that was a learning experience. My, my first couple outings didn't wear snowshoes, didn't really know why I needed to wear them until I found out why I needed to wear them. Um, and, and I joined the winter hiking community. I met a lot of uh, great experienced hikers who are, who are mentors to me. Um, I joined the local search and rescue service, learned a lot from them, um, learned from other people's mistakes. So for photography, um, if I'm thinking about doing a winter hike for sunset or a winter hike for sunrise, I, I pour over the, the weather data, um, the Mount Washington Observatory um, forecast, which is pretty accurate. Um, trail conditions of folks who have been up on that trail before. I've scoped out the location. I know the trail. Um, I won't go somewhere first time in the winter. I'll have gone to it many times, so I'm going to understand where that trail is. So. Um, it has to be that perfect day. It has to be that perfect morning or evening that there's going to be great visibility, that there's no snow events, that it's not windy. Um, I'm not going to be dealing with below zero wind chills. Um, some folks like that for photography, and especially if you want your camera to keep working and you want to get off the mountain alive, um, it's best to wait for those really good days to make that trip up. And um, I've that's, that's kind of what I do. Um, so there may not be many of those above tree line trips each season, but if I get one or two per year, that, that works out well for me. And do you, so you of course plan out all of your logistics in term of, terms of where you're going and the conditions as well. Do you have some favorite top notch spots that, you know, if, if all else fails, you're gonna go back to that one place? 
I've got so many of those. I've got a list of, of all these places are these views I want to get in the perfect, you know, I've got Milky Way locations and, and that's going to be the perfect night. The new moon, the sky's going to be clear. You're going to be facing the right direction. Each month, the Milky Way moves slightly. So you have a bigger or shorter window. Um, <clears throat> winter, I might take a great sun uh, summer shot and I say this would be great in the winter so I have to pick the right place the right time where's the sun coming up where's the sun setting um, and and when I pick places I'm, I'm constantly looking for that composition and if it's in the summertime I can say this will be a great winter shot winter time this will make a great summer shot and the sun and the moon are wonderful because they move throughout the year so they'll it'll be over here this year I mean this time of the year and way over here the next time of the year. So you can say if that sun is over here, that'll make a great shot and that's gonna happen six months from now and how will that look? And white mountain photographers are, I mean, there's a lot of photographers up here and we all take the same shot. So what I love to do is say, you know, what's the angle or the composition? This is a familiar scene, but what's a different way of looking at it? Can I get a slightly different view a slightly different angle that just hasn't been done before or done to death at least and see what I can do to, to come up with that unique vision of, of that familiar spot. Oh, very insightful. Thank you. Um, you mentioned too that you've been hiking for many years when, since when you were young too. When did the when did the collision of photography and hiking and the winter all kind of come together for you? <laughs> that's that's kind of hard to tell. You know, as cameras got easier and digital film, got, uh, digital film, digital um, became more and more popular. Um, I used to shoot with an old um, uh, Pentax uh, thousand and I wasn't very good at it. Um, <laughs> and I had to kind of, when the film came back, I would say, oh, that role came out great. This role didn't. What did they do differently? And, and I, I struggled a little bit with that. But digital opened things up a lot for me. Um, I was heavily into oil painting. I loved oil painting. But again, as digital became more and more prevalent um, and the tools that you could use on your computer, kind of like a digital darkroom, it, it became fun. It, it replaced my oil painting with, I can, I can sculpt out, I can create these images and I can, and I can kind of fine tune them on the computer as far as, as how the shadows and how the, the brightness and how the light works. So, um, that's kind of been that driving force. Well, cool. thanks for, uh, telling us a little bit more. Back to you, Maisie. Great. Thanks, Becky. And thanks, Chris, for your answers. Um, next up, we have Michelle Johnson. She is the acrylic artist in the show this time. Um, yeah. Uh, Chris, what questions do you have for Michelle? Yeah, Michelle, uh, um, I really love your work. And I love Becky's work, too. But um, I love your work with, with colors. And, and it's, just, it's just fantastic to, to see this, such vibrance. And if, if you know, my, my style of photography goes for, I love that color and the contrast. Um, so my first question for you um, is, you know, when, when you are out, I, I see from your bio that you love to go out in the woods and snowshoe and, and enjoy the winter weather, especially. Um, when you get home and you go to put that on canvas, you know, are you printing, are you painting from the memory of that trip or are you taking source photos and painting from that because you have such a great um, way of t capturing the, the, the shadows through the trees and the light through the trees and I'm just curious about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I do take a lot of photos when I'm snowshoeing or hiking or walking or, you know, I even live right in the middle of the woods. So sometimes the pictures uh, that capture my attention happen right out my window. Um, and then I, I do print them and use them as a reference uh, and they inform the work, but very loosely. You can see by the work, I don't work very realistically. So 
I take those photos and then really reinterpret them. And I am all about color. So I, I, you know, when I see just a little hint of a color, I really run with it and exaggerate that. Um, and it just, again, creates uh, a little bit more of that sense of magic that I feel when I am out there. So I don't, I don't ever work plain air. I de am definitely a studio painter. So the photographs are, a big resource for me. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> that, and that leads into my next question. You know, I, I love the dramatic color contrast, especially with the winter with the Alpenglow, where you have the pink and the reds against the white snow. Um, so I noticed that you use a lot of pink hues uh, in your in your paintings um, and in non-traditional ways, um, the, the trees, the mountainsides, um, the shadows in the forest pinks and purples and reds and, and yellows. Um, again, very, very non-traditional in the way it's done. Um, what was your, what was your inspiration for that? Yeah, it's funny. We, I was talking to my son in my studio today because we, I had a lot of work with all that pink stuff going on. And I think particularly because this is a show about the winter and for me, when I look at the snow in the winter, I see a lot of blue and I see a lot of violet. So the kind of complement of that is, are those pinks and oranges and reds and things. So um, by putting those colors together, for me, it kind of creates a bit of a vibration, which uh, then I feel like evokes that kind of uh, emotional response that I'm after and that sense of magic and uh, that fantastical kind of, uh, sense that I feel when I'm in the in the middle of the woods because you know when I'm hiking in the woods and I'm sure we all feel like that because all our work is about the winter uh it's, it's just so magical and so it's a way for me to kind of evoke that magic I feel um yeah yeah thank you <laughs> thank you for that um and and my final question is my favorite piece of yours is nature versus nurture. I, I, I love it. I went into the gallery and I just stood under it and watched, looked at it for a long time. And it's just so spectacular. But I wondered, it's such a unique name. Um, could you expound on your, your reasoning behind that name? What, was, what inspired that name? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the nature, I think, is obvious. You know, I do a lot of paintings of trees and, of course, the landscape. So, um, that's sort of the nature part of the title. But then, um, you know, I think about my role as a, as a female artist, as an artist who's a mother and a grandmother. And uh, th those, those, especially those spectacular trees uh, that to me are like mother trees. And in fact, I'm even doing some reading about how trees communicate and, um, and there's a lot of talk about those mother trees and how they nurture the trees and the flora around them. Um, so th it's in part that connection, but there's also, if you look at the painting, there are pieces that are attached. There are canvas pieces that are separately painted and attached, and they actually uh, have sewing into them. I ran them through my sewing machine and again, that's kind of a nod to, um, I guess, you know, traditional roles as mother and female. And, you know, we think of uh, kind of that, you know, sewing, mending, textile work as something that connects to, um, to mothers, females. So, um, so that's part of that, that connection. And that's, you know, hence the title. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. And back to you, Maisie. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. So next up is Daryl Hawk, and he is the second photographer that we have in the show. Um, so, Michelle, what questions do you have for Daryl? Yeah, Daryl, I was looking through your um, bio, and, and I noticed that um, you're a real world traveler, and you photographed uh, places far and wide. So I was really interested in uh, places that you found most inspiring that really spoke to you as a photographer? 
Well, the places I find the most inspiring are the ones that are the most remote and wild and untouched by time. I like wild places to be young in where my mind can run free and fast with the visual stimulation I experience from dawn to dusk. And uh, as much as I love photographing people along the way, because I'm a documentary photographer, I, uh, the common thread is I, I look for peaceful places, places that are safe to travel alone, but places that are surrounded by powerful nature, a diversity of landscapes, and um, places that uh, more or less are still untouched by time. That's probably the most important thing I look for when I choose places to go to on a map. Mm -hmm. Can you name like a specific place? <laughs> well, Bhutan was probably the most memorable, important expedition I ever did when I traversed it from west to east about uh, 20 years ago. And then I did an incredible journey in Ladakh, which is in northern India, in Kashmir. I traversed that all the way from Pakistan to Tibet and lived with uh, remote tribes and nomads. Uh, met the king of Ladakh and uh, crossed the highest road in the world at 18,635 feet. So those are a couple that come to mind right away, but uh, I have a special affinity towards South America. And I believe by now I've been to almost every country down there. And um, I, I love, love documenting uh, the South American way of life. I have a great fondness and uh, affinity with the people who live there. My Spanish is getting better and better every year. And I'm continuing to, to do documentaries uh, throughout South America. Wow. Well, sometime when we have more time, I'd love to hear about those travels. It sounds amazing. But <laughs> um, for now, I'm going to ask you a little bit about uh, the tools of the trade. You know, now we all have our cell phones and a lot of us, you know, take pictures all the time. Um, can you speak to the differences or how you feel about uh, cell phone photography versus more sophisticated equipment? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because it is an important one. And, um, you know, over my career as a professional photographer, which is been close to 35 years now. Um, I've always felt strongly that it's really about your awareness and capability of seeing the world up close, looking for the light, developing a keen eye for light, um, and being in the right place at the right time, capturing that decisive moment, and taking this camera and composing it, composing these scenes through the viewfinder keeping in mind all these important factors. And of course you wanna have really good equipment to produce high quality images. But I'm the first one who will tell you that I never got hung up on equipment. I've always kept my equipment very simplified, especially when I'm traveling to remote places. I've always felt the less that can go wrong, the better. And I used to shoot with Nikon FM uh, cameras, for many, many years, I was one of the last of the film shooters, and I swore I would never give up my film. But then along came digital, and I finally gave in, and I couldn't be happier now using digital Canon cameras with memory cards. It's much easier to get through airports, and uh, certainly the capabilities of a digital camera are remarkable shooting in low-light situations and, and so forth. But I will also tell you, uh, I am a big fan of using iPhones for producing photos for all the amateur photographers out there or people who really don't have the time to devote, uh, you know, all their time and energy into producing images. It's really about your relationship with the world around you and how you see things and then taking it to the next step and recording it in some way or another for your own personal enjoyment, if nothing else. I've photographed hundreds of contests over the years and given a lot of lectures. And it's really about the way you see the light, you, how you feel and interact with the world around you and to take a camera of any kind, including an iPhone. And I have an i11 right now, which produces amazing photos, not as good as my Canon, of course, but good enough 
to um, really tell a story about what you're uh, experiencing and seeing at that time. So I'm planning on giving a lot of workshops once we get through this pandemic internationally and even in the White Mountains. And I am never gonna discourage anybody to just bring an iPhone with them if they want to the workshop, because to me, it's about the light, the composition, and looking at life up close. That's great. I'm sure you encouraged a lot of amateur photographers, you know, that it's okay to use their phone to capture those images that speak to them. Um, finally, Daryl, if you could just, you know, briefly talk about as a creative, why, why you landed on photography as a medium? Well, I was born into a world of uh, world travelers. My grandfather was a serious photographer. He traveled the world in the 1950s and 60s and went to places that few people had been to before. And even though he was a serious amateur photographer, not a professional, he, along with the combination of getting National Geographic magazine at a very young age, planted these seeds in my mind early on that excited me about the world around me. I've always been a very curious person about the world. I always wanted to learn as much as possible about the world around me. So I've always felt like I've been on a mission all my life, telling stories of the world around me with my camera. And that's why I love sharing my work in as many different ways as possible, through exhibits, lectures. I had a television show for 10 years called The Unconventional Traveler. Uh, I like sharing my work in magazines. And most of all, it's about getting other people inspired about the world around them, seeing the beauty in the world and taking the time to look, up, like, look at life up close with your camera, recording it, and having amazing adventures and experiences along the way. Because this is a beautiful world, it really is. And we all need to take more time to slow down, look at life up close, and if you can take it a step further and record it through the camera, so much the better. For sure, well, thanks so much, Daryl. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Daryl, that was inspiring. So next up is Rebecca Fullerton, and she is the oil painter in this show. Daryl, what questions do you have for Rebecca? Hi, Becky. <laughs> hey. I was wondering if you could tell us what the process is for you to uh, produce these beautiful paintings from beginning to end. Sure, yeah, I would say I'm about a 80% a studio painter. So I typically, I do a lot of hiking. Uh, I do a lot of trail running. So I'm out there on the trails and seeing all of these great places that we have right here in the White Mountains all the time. So whenever I can, I, I try to stop and um, take photos as I'm going along. I typically carry a little sketchbook with me. So if the weather is conducive and I have the time, I'll stop and just sit down and sketch out my scenes, take a few notes. I typically take notes about the, the time, the day, the weather. Uh, I usually carry a little watercolor kit with me so I can take color notes to kind of describe all of the, the hues and the values that I'm seeing to get a really sort of concrete sense of what that time and place and moment looked like while I was there and what the atmosphere of it really was. So I take all of that back into my studio um, and I normally work either on panels or on canvas in oils and also in watercolors on paper. So I take all of these different sort of little snapshots that I have, all these sketches that I have and kind of work out what do I want to use as a composition, what really strikes me as compositionally interesting and um, not, not too symmetrical, not too chaotic, but just sort of a, a happy medium that, that highlights something really unique about the, the mountains. And then I, I sketch out my um, drawings onto my canvas or my panel or my paper lay in things like your, your, your darkest darks when you're working in oil painting, you usually lay in your, your darkest shapes first and then you, you have sort of your medium tones and then your lights are your 
your highlights, those little places in the painting that draw your eye right to it. Um, so I kind of block everything in in really rough, big, sort of ugly shapes. Paintings, paintings go through this kind of ugly stage. <laughs> Most people don't know this, but they, they start out kind of haphazard and, and all over the place. Uh, and then I'm slowly just building layers of, of detail into those and until I end up with um, little teeny tiny brushes size size zero with you know a, I don't know a sixteenth of an inch wide where I'm sitting there painting blades of grass for hours which most artists will tell you is just one of the best ways to spend a day <laughs> it's just painting inches upon inches of tiny things. We, we love this. We, we just, we go off into some other place and, uh, and do this sometimes. And it's just like, what a way to spend a day. <laughs> so that's kind of my process. It goes from these really kind of big, messy, sloppy, abstract things into these much more detailed um, finished paintings. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that photography uh, plays a role in your uh creation of paintings. And I'm sure you, like myself, feel we're very blessed to live here in the White Mountains with these incredible distinct seasons to draw upon. And I was wondering um, if you had a favorite season to paint in. Um, I, I mean, I love winter. I've been challenged and, uh, and inspired this year, especially to paint a bunch of new winter scenes. But, the kind of the, the strangeness of the shapes and the complexity of getting, of expressing and paint the idea of shadow on snow is this endlessly, endlessly challenging thing. But I'm, I'm a sucker for a White Mountain summer. They're so brief and they're so glorious. And just that, that combination of the blue skies that we get and the big puffy clouds floating by and that just incredible intense green of our forests against the, that rough rocky you know landscape that we have. I'm a huge fan of painting rocks. <laughs> I could also paint rocks for hours on end um, but I just love and it, the summertime also allows you of course to, to spend a lot more time in the alpine zone above tree line in our mountains so you get a much more immersive experience being able to travel in the warm weather and really just get out there and, and experience it all so i'm a i'm a big time summer fan i would say yeah a lot longer days with a lot more light to to work with um one last question uh, what is the most important lesson you say you you have learned as a as a painter during your uh, illustrious career? <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it illustrious yet. <laughs> we get there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel like as a, as a painter, you, you can go for years just sort of trying and failing. Not every painting is going to turn out. You have to be pretty accepting of, of that idea. But I, I always tell other painters to take classes and take workshops and, and learn from other painters. There's always going to be somebody that's technically better than you are, that has a greater mastery over whatever medium you work in. So I, I try at least once a year to, to take a workshop with somebody that I really, really admire. And I really want to get some very specific things out of their teaching. So for example, I took a workshop this past fall with Andrew Orr, who is an incredibly talented landscape painter um, over in Vermont. And he teaches these wonderful workshops. And he was describing the, this, this process of layering, of, of, of building up a painting slowly and carefully. And his advice was always to, when you're laying out a painting, try to keep it as dark as possible as soft as possible for as long as possible. So it's almost like you're, you're trying to paint the painting as if you're looking at the scene with blurred vision for the first third, maybe two thirds of the painting. 
And then eventually you really start to add in these little details and these sharp points. And it creates this incredible feeling of depth of three dimensional dimensionality, but it takes incredible patience. And so the learning is, is in learning to be patient and to go slowly with your work. It's, I'm sure it's a little like setting up all of your camera equipment very carefully and deliberately to set yourself up for success. It's the same way with painting is you're just kind of waiting and going along and trying to set yourself up for great painting at the end. Well, thank you for that great insight. Sure. Yeah, that's really wonderful. All that artful wisdom. I feel like I just attended the workshop. <laughs> um, so next, if I want to open the floor to anyone who would like to ask the artist questions. It's so there's a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, I have to learn gonna, how to do this. We're going to have to learn how to do it here. OK, I see. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so um, Kate asked, Chris, do you frame a shot more by color or light and shadow? Oh, that's a good question, Kate. Um, light is everything with photography, so it's all about the light. Um, I frame a shot with the components of what I'm looking at. Um, I like balance, and when I take a picture, it's just going to balance, whether, whether you use the rule of thirds or you use um, the, the magic circle or spiral or whatever you use. To me, it's just, does it click? And if I look at it and it clicks, I'm happy with that composition. And then light has to be the, the, the big factor as to how it works as an image. Because you can take a flat image of anything and, and it can look nice and it can be a good shot, but the light turns it from a photograph into, into a work of art. And so I look for that light. Great. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, I did. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Becky. Oh, this is hiding. Um, oh, you can click left. Yeah, go ahead. Close. Oh, I'm just gonna here. Oh, I see. Just a moment. Just, just Maisie has to learn how to use a computer here. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Becky, are you always looking for the perfect trail to capture in your works? Oh, yeah. Yeah, boy, trail us us trail nerds. <laughs> Always let man. I'm always looking for that perfect combination of if it's if it's a trail in the forest, there's got to be just that kind of that right combination of rocks and you know maybe it's I see a trail and I think oh that that just looks so perfectly like rugged and craggy and I want to want to capture how difficult this trail looks. Mm -hmm. Or if it's something that's weaving across a ridge line, you, you're always trying to kind of place it within the composition or find a composition that, that just makes it like you want to walk into the painting and just follow that off into the distance. So yeah, trails are, and it's, it's that sign of life too. It's, it's not only pure nature, but it's that sign that, that humans have been there that we've we've carved this like weird little path through the wilderness and um, it just kind of shows that 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 presence of us and, and of yourself too if you see a trail in a painting you you sort of naturally gravitate towards seeing yourself on that trail so it's yeah there's a uh, there's so many good ones here too I'm sort of casually redlining I'm trying to hike every trail in the White Mountain National Forest, which is a, quite a task. I don't, I'm not very um, kind of really motivated to just do it all at once, but I'm always up for a new trail, for sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Becky, while we still have you on here, um, tell us about the photo behind you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so this is one of my uh, older paintings from 2013. Oh my gosh, it's eight years old now. Um, so this is my mom in the 1950s when she was growing up and she lived in Vermont. 
And my grandfather, they moved up from Long Island. So they were, they were Flatlanders. They were New Yorkers. And they moved to Vermont. They bought this little motel. And my grandfather was told, you have to go hunting. You have to be a hunter to live up here in, in rural Vermont. And so he went out hunting and he stopped the car and saw a deer along the side of the road. And he shot it and put it on the hood of the car and went home and he never went hunting again. <laughs> <laughs> this is a a representation of the one and only deer that my grandfather ever shot and they made a big production out of it but oh what a great story I had this deer so yeah so that's my mom <laughs> well kate's wondering daryl with all your travels with all your travels what surprises did you discover that you didn't know before stepping foot in the location or meet the people also, is there, is there an experience that always escapes photographic capture? Um, I guess one of, the, one of the most important lessons that I've learned over the years is no matter how much you plan a trip or have the most perfect itinerary in the world, um, you have to allow a lot of freedom uh, for things to go wrong. Uh, I'm usually away for three to four weeks at a time in remote areas, traveling alone. So the most important thing is to get a good uh, guide and driver, and you try to achieve certain goals with uh, your photography, and cover certain distances, and um, of course you wanna have adventures and magical experiences the entire time, but you're constantly weighing things uh, out, we sometimes unforeseen adventures come along that delay you. Uh, I've been stuck in situations with powerful nature um, has uh, prevented me from getting into other areas. I've been in um, certain places throughout the world where there's been um, protests, riots in the streets, roads closed, uh, rock slides. Um, I was even apprehended in the Andes once by military police who suspected I was a cocaine runner uh, on one of the most dangerous roads in the world that I didn't even realize I was on. I was on a cocaine route. <laughs> so the bottom line is that things happen when you travel and you just have to go with the flow, expect the unexpected um, and, and allow a certain amount of freedom for things to go wrong and, and just have really good, good instincts. Um, and, and be on guard at all times, but always think the best and always be positive about uh, what's happening and, and the people around you. And what was the second question? The second question is, is there a story behind the horse in the wild one? Oh, the horse in the wild one, yeah. You know, uh, one of the things uh, I love about being up here in the White Mountains is I'm surrounded by horses wherever I go especially here in Lancaster. It's great. I love horses. I've been riding all my life and I've been doing a little riding already with a neighbor's horse down the road, but uh, there's something really magical and beautiful about a horse. I love watching them uh, run free. Um, I, I love watching them, just observing them up close. There's about five horses a mile down the road that I walk to almost every day and feed them carrots. And they're beautiful, they're beautiful animals. And so I hope to photograph uh, horses more and more because I think it's a universal subject that most people can relate to and feel a strong love uh, for when, they, when they, they see the beauty of a horse, especially up close as you saw in one of my photographs. For sure. Well, Michelle, Tom and I are wondering if you developed this style that you have over time and um, if you ever did realistic, like more realistic pieces. Oh, oh, you're muted, you're muted. Michelle. There we go. There you go. I think. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You know, I, I, when my kids were little, my medium was colored pencil. Mm -hmm. So I did very hyper realistic stuff um and of course in the beginning you're so focused on on technique you know mm -hmm. and getting things right and i think everybody starts out in realism in a way because you're you're learning how to draw and paint and all that 
So um, I started out like that. And then when I got into painting, you know, I started to move into uh, painting from emotion a little bit more. And then finally I got my master's, my MFA. And that's what really prompted this new style because I was so pushed into digging deeper into why. Why do I choose the landscape? What, you know, what's the deeper meaning in painting the landscape? I couldn't just say to my mentors and the, the you know, the critiquers <laughs> that, you know, it was beautiful. And I, and I was, you know, I wanted to paint a scene because, uh, because it just spoke to me because it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research and I uh, really started to delve into really why, what, you know, what's my connection to the landscape? And, and that's when it brought me to um, thinking about, well, I started to think about my childhood and that connection. And, and that's when the magic started to, you know, come mm -hmm. forward a little bit more in the paintings. And then, and then I started to, and I continued to do that reading about uh, the landscape and not just the surface of the landscape, but what's happening underneath. And particularly what happens with trees and how they communicate, because trees are such a big subject for me. So I'm really kind of in the midst now of reading about uh, the amazing stuff that happens with trees and how they communicate and how we're connected to them as, as creatures in the land, you know? So that's kind of my ongoing quest, but that's how the style develops. And, you know, my hope is that it just continues to morph and, and do different things, you know? I'm kind of excited to see where it'll go from here. Yeah, well, that's so inspiring to hear. I identify so much with your work and it's really nice to hear about your journey because yeah, I'm somewhere there in the very beginning. Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. And thank you for, to all the artists for being here all in one place. I think it's, you know, it is unfortunate that we can't all be together, but there's something about this virtual space that feels like we can really just drop in and be with each other. And yeah, so it's a really special thing. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. What a great evening. Um, thanks all of you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, Chris. Um, and, um, you know, if you can't make it here, again, go online, take a look at it. I think we're going to try to go and post. Can we, are we going to be able to post the Zoom thing? We will post this, um, a recording of this on our website so you can take a look at it. Um, this, again, exhibition is up through the end of March. And then our schedule after that is the next show will be um, color. And that will be the works of um, Pam Tarbell and Anne Sanderson. Our summer exhibition will be the work of Doug Masery. It's be called Nomadic Threads, uh, Doug Weissman and Doug Masery. And the fall, we're still working out the schedule. We know that um, the, la the end of the year, we will have a member show, probably doing a little bit different format than the small work show this year. Um, just so that we we're just changing it up a bit and all of our exhibitions are running two months so it gives people a longer chance to come in and see everything. So we're open here all week and if you want to take a little drive um, and um, you know we're um, it's just such a, so too bad we can't do this in person but this is a great format. So thank you again everyone have a great night and happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Thanks so much.